And for this reason, several frameworks have been proposed to build NISIX uh, in this setting. I'm not mentioning uh, all the possible, I'm oh, sorry, oh, okay. I'm not mentioning all the possible uh, construction that exists. So for instance, the hidden bit model is not mentioned here, uh, but among the uh, frameworks that have been proposed, uh, we have pairing equations, which led to the Grotza high proof that are very well known, I guess. Uh, and also uh, other frameworks which rely on correlation intractable hash functions, uh, essentially uh, compiling any uh, a special class of uh, sigma protocols called Traptor Sigma protocols uh, using uh, essentially the Fiat Schmidt transform. But instead of using correlation, uh, instead of using uh, collision resistant hash function, a uh, more sophisticated tool is used instead. Now, uh, more specifically in this talk, I want to focus on NISIX, as I mentioned, that are based on prime order groups. Uh, primordial groups indeed. And uh, for a very long time, the only construction that were known in this setting were uh, those uh, coming from pairing equation, essentially grots a high proof. Uh, those proof actually have a very nice feature uh, that is they only use the group in a black box way. Uh, and this uh, means that, and this implies also that the NISIC that comes from this technique uh, inherits nice homomorphic properties from the group. So for instance, we can re-randomize this proof or we can compose them or make statements about them. Uh, and for a very long time, actually, it was believed that pairings were necessary to build NISICs uh, from, pair, from uh, prime order groups. However, uh, in a groundbreaking result in 2021, that was actually best uh, European paper uh, by Jane and Jean, uh, it was shown that correlation intractable hash function can be based on dif uh, decisional Diffie-Hellman even without pairings. And this led to the first construction of NISICs in prime order groups that don't rely on pairing at all. But they come with a great limitations. Uh, the usage of the group is absolutely non-black box. Uh, you need to hash group elements. You need to have a circuit that uh, essentially implements the group operations. So all the nice homomorphic properties that you have in Grotza high proof are essentially lost. So the question I'm going to ask in this talk is, uh, can we have best, best of both world constructions? Can we base the non-interactive zero knowledge proof on black box group without using pairing in any way? And by the way, I just want to quickly uh, mention, like, what do I mean by black box in this case? Uh, so before I answer this question, I want to answer, like, what do I mean by black box? And by black box, I really mean, like, uh, something that can be instantiated in the Maurer group model. So the Maurer group model is just an abstract model of computation uh, where you don't, uh, like, where a user does, doesn't have actually access to the group itself. Like, there is no uh, circuit implementing the group or, like, no group element representation. But everything is locked uh, inside a Turing machine. Uh, and with this Turing machine, you can interact by asking it to uh, compute uh, the group elements, the, to compute the group operations. And at any point, uh, to ask if two group elements in the list of group elements that are stored inside the machine are equal or not. So the most notable feature is that in, it means that uh, inside this abstract model of computation, um, whoever is interacting with the generic group uh, it doesn't ever see the group element in any way. It can only see if two group elements are the same or not. And this is in sharp contrast, contrast uh, with a different model, which you may have heard of, like the Shoop group model, where group elements uh, are attached to random labels. And now this is very different also because in Shoop group model, you can actually instantiate the random oracle. In Mario group model, you can't. So this is a very uh, significant difference. There are many more. So. Uh, my result eventually is that uh, in Maurer group model, uh, NISICs unfortunately don't exist. Uh, and in particular, uh, there exists no NISIC argument of knowledge uh, if you want to show the knowledge of a pre-image under a one-way function. And this includes a very large class of relations, like the most notable of which being the discrete logarithm, but many more are included as well. And a second result is uh, that NISICs that are not necessarily argument of knowledge don't exist as well. Uh, but for languages, there are hard subset membership problems. Um, so this class of languages are essentially like a generalization of DDH, if you want, where you can sample from the language and from the complement of the language uh, in such a way that the two distributions are indistinguishable. So these include, again, DDH, but other, other examples like MDDH or DLIN are also included in this, ex, in this class. Now, uh, unfortunately, this result cannot hold unconditionally, of course, because we do have NISICs, or at least we believe we have NISICs. Uh, therefore, actually, all these negative results only apply against unbounded adversary that are limited in making polynomially many number of queries to the generic group model oracle. 
So this essentially means that we cannot base the hardness entirely on problems that are hard because of the prime order groups. So now, uh, you listen to this talk, maybe you were like planning to build NE6 uh, from prime order group in a black box way, you might be very disappointed, but uh, fear not. Actually, uh, there are ways to circumvent my results. And there are three ways to do so. Uh, the first way is simply just uh, giving up on using the group in a black box way. And this can be done uh, as easily as just taking hash of group elements. And for instance, like the correlation intractable hash function construction falls in this category. Another way of like circumventing this negative result is just using more structure, like pairing is one example, and this leads to Grotza high proof. But you can also assume the group is of unknown order, and this may also give you NISIX. Finally, if you really want to have group, uh, if you really want to use the group in a black box way, and uh, you don't really want to use unknown order or pairings at all, then at that point you must uh, rely on external hardness assumption. Uh, meaning, for instance, LWE, RSA, or anything that cannot be unconditionally proven hard in the generic group model. So, having said that the results, I'm going to uh, maybe give some intuition on why, uh, I mean, how we get these results. Uh, so the first uh, negative result was for uh, argument of knowledge, uh, for um, showing the knowledge of a pre-image of a one-way function. And the core idea is reducing NISIX argument of knowledge to vector commitments. And we built on a previous negative result that appeared in TCC 2022, um, uh, okay, uh, which says that vector commitments in Maurer group model don't exist or actually provide some lower bound in that case. So that result in particular, in particular turned out to be uh, not strong enough. So we first uh, enhanced that result to capture hiding vector commitments, special class of vector commitments, uh, and then we show that in that case, the commitment has to be very large. Uh, but from NISIC argument of knowledge, we can build commitments that are extremely short. And this, by contradiction, implies that no NISIC argument of knowledge exists. Uh, so first, let me uh, recap what vector commitments are. Uh, so vector commitments is a primitive, like as standard commitments. But the key difference is that you can commit to a vector of messages and then only open specific positions. Now, the security property is position binding, uh, meaning that uh, asking that uh, for a given position i, it's very hard to open to two different messages. And in our generic group model, it was shown uh, by Gennaro Fiore, uh, by Catalano Fiore, Gennaro, and myself in 2022 uh, that some lower bound on the commitment length and opening proof uh, must apply. So in this setting, we actually enhance, uh, we uh, introduce a new, a new notion of security uh, that is not only position binding, but also hiding. Um, and hiding is essentially defined as a uh, standard indistinguishability game uh, where uh, the adversary simply like chooses two different vectors. Uh, the challenger gives a commitment of one of those. An adversary can ask for opening of those positions that are equal in both vectors. Like this is essential to avoid trivial attacks, of course. Uh, and any vector commitment that satisfy uh, that for in which uh, adversary has negligible advantage is called hiding. So this is just basic definition. Uh, and we show that in Marer group model, a stronger bound apply in this setting. Um, so just to remind, uh, the previous relation was that either the commitment or the opening proof must to be at least linear in the number of messages I'm committing to. In this case, we get that the commitment itself must contain at least n group elements. So the commitment has to be very large when uh, vector commitments are both hiding and position binding. Uh, okay, so uh, the key idea of building now a short vector commitment, assuming we have non-interactive uh, zero knowledge argument of knowledge, is really just using Pedersen commitments with extra steps. Now the key ingredient uh, in order to make the whole construction hiding uh, is going to be a hard code predicate for vlog. And now I'm going to only make the example of vlog as a one way function, but you can generalize this to any one way function actually, up to using like Golder Clavin or other extra uh, other tools. Um, so assuming, assume we have a hard code predicate for uh, vlog that is a bit essentially of the exponent that is very hard to guess even after you see uh, the, the group element g to the x. And what we do is uh, we get a, a vector commitment to bits. Um, so given this vector of bits b1, bn, uh, we choose uh, exponents xi uh, so that the hardcore bits matches the bit we want to commit to. 
And then we produce a Pedersen commitment to all these exponents. It is as simple as that. Uh, and this is, of course, like constant size. There is only one group element here. And later on, when we want to open a specific position, what we do is like we give uh, the exponent of position high, and then the group element g, actually there is a typo, gj to the xj, uh, along with a proof that we know the exponent xj. Now, this proof is essential because in the proof reduction, we need to extract the exponent, or otherwise the prover, the committer might cheat and open to different uh, uh, to different messages. Um, but thanks to the fact that we are using a hardcore predicates, so these bits are very hard to guess, even given j to the g to the xj, and these proof are zero knowledge. Uh, the resulting vector commitment is hiding, and of course also position binding because um, Pedersen commitments are binding. So eventually, we violate uh, the lower bound I presented before. So for the sake of time, I'm going to skip maybe the general construction for one-way function. Uh, but essentially, uh, I generalized the previous idea up to using goldrake levin pred hardcore predicate for general uh, one-way function. So the second result instead uh, is the impossibility of music uh, for hard subset membership language. And just again to remind what, uh, OK. So the general strategy in this case is slightly different. Uh, instead of re uh, reducing uh, to vector commitment, we reduce to a different primitive that are signatures. Uh, and in particular, again, we um, we use the fact that signatures are known to be impossible in Maurer generic group model. However, there are some caveats. Uh, our construction, like for signatures from NISIC, we only have message space that is extremely small. Actually, message space will only have one message. Uh, but signatures are known to be impossible for message space that is somewhat large, at least the size of the key. So some uh, tweaks, I mean, some uh, we need to use some uh, extra, I mean, we need to use the adversary in a non-black box way uh, to uh, eventually get the negative result. So first, let me remind again, what is a hard subset membership problem? So again, it's a language uh, so that we can sample from the language and from its complement, so we can sample uh, correct and false statements in an indistinguishable way. And every time we sample from uh, a correct statement, uh, a correct statement, uh, we also get a witness for this uh, for the correct statement we sampled. So this is uh, the key thing. I mean, again, this is generally generalized DDH, MDDH, and many other interesting problems. Uh, now, how do we build uh, signatures given NISIX? So this is going to be the last reduction I'm going to show today. Uh, the key, the idea is very simple. So. We're going to build signatures for uh, uh, we're going to build the signatures uh, with message space containing only one element, uh, and we're going to use the fact that the argument they're using is a zero knowledge proof. So first, uh, by the way, there is a minor note I should make uh, in the model. Um, I mean, uh, so we need to essentially define signatures in a model where uh, there is also a CRS that is generated even before a designer produce the verification key and signing key. And this is just for technical details, uh, so don't care too much about this anyway. Uh, so the CRS, uh, that it's part of the verification key if you want, is just a false statement. So this is the beginning. Uh, the verification key and signing key are a fake CRS and a trapdoor generated by the simulator for the NISIC. And a signature for the only message in the message space is going to be a simulated proof. Now, assuming that the NISIC, uh, of course, is like sound and correct, uh, you can show that uh, this is a correct and sound, uh, this is a correct and unforgeable uh, signature. You actually need something more. You need like uh, uh, the hard subset mem membership problem is important here because the simulator is only guaranteed to work on correct statement and not on false statement. Uh, so it's important here that you cannot distinguish that X is false or not false. So it will always give you a correct proof. So that is a minor detail. Uh, but that aside, uh, this should give you this gives you uh, an unforgeable signature that is also almost always correct. Now the key idea here is that if at any point in time we have an adversary that makes a forgery for that scheme, actually it's better if I just stay on that slide. The key idea is that if we can make a forgery of this scheme, actually we can have a proof of a false statement, and essentially we break uh, soundness for our uh, zero knowledge proof. So. Uh, now we introduce the adversary that was defined again uh, in previous work uh, that appear in TCC again, same work as the vector commitment one. And that adversary essentially works as follow. 
it, initially, it gets uh, the CRS and verification key from the signature scheme is trying to break. Uh, it runs, uh, and at some point, it either returns a forgery for the signature scheme that is trying to break, or it makes a signature query uh, to the signing oracle. Uh, and after it gets uh, the correct signatures for the message he asks a signature for, it will find a linear relation among the group element containing the verification key. So importantly, the argument there was that uh, if you find too many, I mean, at some point, like you cannot find too many linear relations because there are only a polynomially bounded number of group elements in the verification key. So after this happened polynomially many times, it must be the case that the adversary returns a forgery. So that's why you need many messages in the message space. Um, so how do we use this adversary to break uh, security of our NISIC? Uh, remind in this case that, of course, like the CRS in our case is going to be a false statement. And the verification key is going to be the NISIC CRS. So forgeries are proof, essentially, and, and that's it. So a first approach would be the following. Get our adversary that wants to break uh, the soundness of NISIC, uh, first get, of course, the NISIC CRS. And then he must come up with a false statement along with a proof that, that uh, verifies it. So what he can do is that he first sample a false statement, of course. And it, and it uh, gives this false statement and then is XRS to the adversary that breaks signatures. So this adversary can either to, it can do two things. It can either uh, return a forgery for uh, the his own signature scheme, that, which means like it returns a proof of the, uh, this false statement, meaning that our adversary succeeded. Or uh, it can ask for a signature query that is a proof of this false statement. Now, this is where the trouble comes, because there is no way really we can prove the false statement, uh, given also that the CRS is the honest CRS. So really, we cannot answer this signature query. So the best we can do is just, OK, maybe try again. A different statement maybe might work. Now, the issue there is that this can happen like infinitely many times, and probably there is no bound you can get. So now many times you need to repeat, not even exponential. Like This can really just go on forever. Um, so the thing is that we need a way in which we can sometimes answer the signature query and sometimes get uh, a proof that is actually a proof of a false statement. So the idea is really just uh, executing this adversary in two different words. So at the beginning of uh, each execution, we really we, we flip a coin and decide in which word uh, we are going to execute our own adversary. In the first word, it's basically what I described before. Uh, we use a false statement that we expect the adversary to give us uh, as for a forgery. Whereas in the second word, we actually sample a correct statement along with a proof. Uh, if the adversary gives us a forgery, this is actually meaningless because this is a correct statement. So this proof is going to prove a correct statement. Like we don't really care that much about it to break soundness. Uh, but the interesting thing is that in this case, if the adversary uh, asks for a signature query, that is, it asks for a proof of the statement X, now we know a witness for X. And therefore, we can prove it using the prover. Like, we're actually simulating the simulator using the prover. Like, that was like fun, I guess. And uh, eventually, the adversary returns us uh, a linear combination of the group elements contained in the, CR in the CRS. So again, uh, it can only find polynomially many times a uh, linear, random linear combination of the CRS. So after this happened polynomially many times, it must be the case that uh, at some point it's going to return uh, a forgery. And, and now in this point, we actually use a lot the fact that uh, the language is an hard is a uh, hard subset membership problem uh, because adversary cannot tell in which word is being executed. So with probability one half, uh, we actually execute adversary in one setting in which is giving us something useful, either a linear combination of the group elements in the CRS or uh, a correct proof of a false statement. So uh, this is uh, essentially, uh, so this implies eventually that soundness does not hold for this class of NISICs. So just to recap, uh, I showed that uh, NISIC argument of knowledge uh, cannot be, sorry, in Maurer group model, we cannot build a NISIC argument of knowledge uh, when we want to show knowledge of a pair image under a one-way function. Uh, and uh, similarly, we cannot, uh, we cannot build NISICs uh, for uh, a hard subset membership problem, again, in our generic group model. Uh, there are some open, some open questions, uh, some questions are left open. Um, one of them is simply like if we can like close the gaps that are left open or if we can enhance or extend the class of uh, the knowledge or the class of proof that these results applies to. So for instance, can we prove the same results for witness hiring uh, proof 
or uh, can we extend this to other languages besides hard homogeneous uh, sorry uh, hard subset membership problems which seems to be uh, very hard to me because the proof crucially relies on this uh, to go through so that was it uh, thanks for your attention Yeah. And so the talk, uh, I mean, I think, uh, so the NISIC case, it seems to be tied into the simulator, your lower bound, right, with the signatures. But the, the, for the NISIC case, uh, yeah. your lower bound seems to be tied to the simulator very much. So uh, it's really tied? Oh, sorry, didn't get the question. Tied to the simulator. Uh, uh, yes. So you really need the zero knowledge property, but for an argument of knowledge, do you have any thoughts about using a witness indistinguishable one? Uh, okay. So the thing is that I guess that if you, uh, I think you can reduce witness indistinguishability to uh, zero knowledge, like using the or three probably. So mm -hmm. I mean, I, I guess that probably impossibility for the music like somehow implies also for uh, impossibility for witness indistinguishability. So do you have, but, have that? Oh, sorry. Do you have that? No, 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 no. Uh, yeah. I mean, this is just yeah, yeah, out loud. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think, I mean, that, that would then surprise me too much. But for witness hiding, I think that would be slightly more complicated, probably. Yeah. I mean, I actually think that it's, I mean, I think there is some hope to do that in the construction for uh, the vector commitments, uh, because there you don't really need to simulate too much. The yeah. Thing of you just really need that no information is leaked. So maybe witness hiding is enough. Um, However, I think it's going to be much harder for the just NISIC case because then you really need a simulator, as you said. So, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Are there any questions? Yes, I will check that. And the Zoom audience. Um, I can't see any more questions. So, let's thanks to the speaker again. Yes, can people hear me? Yeah. Okay. The last talk of this session is a, a note of non interactive zero knowledge from CDH by Jofra Koto, Abhishek Jain, Sozo Jin, Willy Koch. Then Willy will give a talk. Please. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your introduction. So, so yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, non interactive zero knowledge from the computational development assumption. And this is joint work uh, with Joe Fakuto, Abhishek Jain, and John Jong Jain. Uh, so let me just recall uh, what uh, I'll be talking about. So this talk will be about non-interactive zero knowledge, which is a primitive that involves uh, two parties, a prover and a verifier. And the general goal is that the prover wants to convince the verifier that some statement X that they share is in some NP language error that is decided in advance. Uh, so to do that, uh, the prover um, generates, given properly, like so, uh, some witness, uh, some witness W, some proof, and the verifier decides to accept or reject the proof. So the standard property that we want out of a zero knowledge uh, no, uh, of a non-interactive zero knowledge proof is completeness. So if the prover indeed starts with a valid witness, then the verifier should accept the proof. We want uh, in this talk I'll be um, concerned with computational soundness which states that if a statement is not in the language, then no efficient prover can generate a proof that, the, that makes the verifier accept. And last, we want a security property against verifiers. And for us, that will mean that if the prover uh, generates, a correctly, uh, generates a proof correctly using a valid witness, then the verifier doesn't learn anything out of it. So I won't even bother uh, formalizing that, that statement here. We won't need it. Okay, so that's the object um, that we will uh, that will uh, um, that will study here. Uh, technically, this uh, zero knowledge property requires a CRS, uh, but uh, let, let's ignore that for now. Uh, so yeah, the zero, um, zero knowledge have many uh, have many applications, and well, non-interactive zero knowledge have a lot of like the, the upside of zero knowledge without paying the cost of like interaction. So this is pretty good, and we want to understand. Sorry. Uh, yeah, anyway, the, the, the main question, <laughs> I, I don't know how to go back, sorry. Um, so, so the main, yeah, 
anyway, the, the, main, the main question is how to build um, uh, NISIX. And like, uh, on the theory side, uh, from what assumptions uh, do we get NISIX? So it turns out that if we are happy with uh, making heuristic assumptions, uh, then we can get NISIX in the Ronda Morocco model. And uh, if you are happy making uh, pretty strong assumptions, so namely indistinguishability obfuscation, then we all, uh, can also get it. So the bulk of theory work in the realm of NISIX is to build NISIX from concrete public assumptions. And it turns out that most of the work from, yeah, uh, from, from building NISIX is uh, focused here. Uh, so it turns out that we have constructions uh, initially when NISIX uh, was defined, we uh, obtained constructions uh, from factoring and related assumptions, so number theoretic assumptions. And shortly after pairings were introduced, we got construction from pairings. And much more recently, we, get, uh, we got a breakthrough works that gave constructions of NISIX from uh, lattices or the decisional defined assumption. So kind of the, 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 the hope and the main open question that we would like uh, to answer is whether uh, we can build NISIX generally from public assumption. However, it seems that we are quite far from that. And like one step towards that, is to try to uh, at least fill the gap and uh, build NISIX from uh, concrete assumptions that we know uh, imply, uh, uh, imply public encryption. But um, uh, and, and yeah. so, so notably missing are the computational dependent assumption and the learning uh, party with an assumption. OK, so what we do in this work is we build uh, NISIX. And if you care about, uh, about it, ZAPs, so ZAP arguments from the sub-exponential harness of the computational definite element assumption. So there are, there are some small restriction on, on the type of groups that we can use. Um, so that, uh, in this talk, I won't talk uh, too much about the arguments. But um, the main drawback of our construction is that this comes with kind of a very awkward uh, notion of soundness. So what's our, the main caveat of our construction? Uh, we get a weird notion of soundness where soundness is uh, defined with respect to security parameters. And the only thing that we can get, uh, we know how to prove is uh, to prove that our um, argument system is sound on infinitely often security parameters. So, so that's not what you usually want. Usually you want soundness for all large enough security parameters. And the second drawback is that uh, we only get soundness against uniform cheating provers. So usually you allow adversaries to, uh, to be able to have access to um, potentially hard to compute uh, non-uniform advice, uh, we don't allow that here. Yeah. So if you care about a more precise statement, we essentially uh, get most of the, the adjectives that, uh, that you care about. The main restrictions are we only get computational soundness and computational zero. Okay, so that's the, 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 the statement of the main result. Uh, so the, the main assumptions that I will be wor working over are like just just recall uh, the kind of different type of assumptions that are uh, defined with respect to a cyclic group of prime order given by a generator, and we have two main, uh, main like computational assumptions that imply public encryption in this realm. The, the CDH assumption, which says that given G to the G to the B, it's hard to compute G to the B, and uh, the DDH assumption that says that. Uh, it's hard to kind of decide those tuples. Like the, this will look uniform to you. Uh, so just as a, as a sanity check, uh, uh, this problem is harder than this problem. So uh, assuming that this is hard is um, uh, is a, a stronger assumption than uh, assuming that this is hard. Right. And turns out that this is not just about uh, uh, syntactics and uh, like it, it seems that. The, the difference of syntax of this problem actually reflects quite strongly in terms of like what we can build from those assumptions. And from uh, it seems that uh, the DDH assumption gives us much more structured harness in terms of building cryptography. So if you're a theorist like me, there are many like, very, very uh, nice tools that we can get from DDH uh, that we really don't know how to build from CDH. So even though those look uh, slightly related and um, like the, the statement of the uh, uh, the harness looks uh, pretty related. Uh, in terms of like expressivity of the assumptions, they look pretty different so far. Uh, okay. So what happens in the world of NISIX? Uh, what do we know? Uh, it turns out that from the Diffie-Hellman assumption, we actually know how to get NISIX uh, for assuming the sub-exponential harness of DDH uh, with some restriction of the groups. Uh, looking, at, looking ahead in our main results, we'll have uh, similar restrictions. Uh, so uh, NISICs are good if you assume the stronger assumption of, of DDH. So what happened in the in the CDH setting? It turns out that uh, kind of the best uh, that we can do 
is uh, getting NISIX for kind of a relaxation of, uh, we get a relaxation of NISIX where the verifier is given a reusable secret key to verify proofs. Um, but more generally, the works that uh, Bjornis uh, give a general blueprint that allow to build, assuming CDH, a NISIC, assuming that the verifier can design whether group elements are of the form of like those, uh, those inputs. So given three group elements, deciding uh, whether, um, whether they are of this form is enough to build uh, NISIX. And so this is a more general blueprint, uh, blueprint that ju uh, than just this statement. So in kind of the, the, the original use was to show that for those tuples, we have good, uh, good proof systems, so good designated verifier proof systems for those. And that shows that we can build the designated verifier NISIX from CDH. But another use of that is that if the verifier decides uh, itself those tuples, then we can actually get an ISIC from, uh, from CDH. So in particular, if uh, the verifier decides himself those tuples given a uh, cell pairing, then we get uh, an ISIC from CDH where the, the CDH is, uh, where the group is also associated with the pairing. Yeah. So, okay, there, this is a lot of work, but kind of the main takeaway is that as long as deciding this language uh, is easy, so that's really related to br breaking DDH. If we can break DDH, then we get an ISIC from CDH. That's the main takeaway of like this final portion. So what we do in this work is kind of combining those in a very uh, like retrospectively very uh, straightforward way. So here's the arguments. We start with a group where CDH holds. I know I told you about two different results, two, beyond, uh, two different ways to build uh, NISIX. Either I can break DDH, in which case I get a NISIC from CDH, or I cannot break DDH, and then I get a NISIC from DDH. Right. So what happens is that, well, uh, a natural conclusion is that, well, if it's not broken, uh, if, uh, if it's not secure, then it's broken. And so like regardless, what I get is, uh, is a NISIC from CDH. So that's a very uh, tempting conclusion to, to draw, but turns out that uh, this is not quite true because we have annoying, um, because of like how we formalize security. So, so not being secure is not the same as like being broken in like uh, uh, what I said. So now I'll go into like uh, slightly more details about like those notions of security. So again, uh, kind of the, um, the main argument is saying, so either DDH is secure, we get an ISIC. So suppose that DDH is not secure, do we get an algorithm that breaks DDH in a way that uh, suffices to uh, get NISIX from CDH. And it turns out that there are a bunch of mismatches uh, because of how you defend security. So a first mismatch uh, is that uh, is in terms of uh, advantage of the adversaries that we consider. So if an adversary that breaks DDH in that sense only breaks DDH with very small probability, so slightly high, but still pretty small, whereas here we want a break that breaks kind of on most cases. Another mismatch is on the distribution over the, over the inputs. Uh, DDH technically uh, only ensures a break over random inputs. Here we want to, build, uh, to break DDH over kind of arbitrary worst case inputs. Another mismatch is that stand, uh, standardly uh, DDH is a non-uniform notion of security. So if DDH is not broken, the only thing that you get is a non-uniform attack. And also you just know that there exists an attack, but I have no way to like get my hands on it. Uh, whereas, if you want to instantiate the NISIC from CDH, the verifier will run the break. Right? So, so that's very different from like how we think about uh, a proof system that, that, that we have in our hands. Uh, and last, in order to falsify the security of DDH, it, only, uh, it suffices to break DDH over infinitely many security parameters, whereas here we want to break uh, DDH on all, security, all large enough security parameters. So those are like kind of annoying mismatches. It uh, turns out uh, that the first two we can uh, fix uh, by amplifying DDH using some uh, random self-reducibility. Uh, but uh, kind of the, the last two are like quite more annoying and looking ahead, that will be the source of our caveat. Uh, okay, but still modulo does uh, mismatches. It turns out that this simple disjunction argument gives you already kind of nice uh, statements in terms of how um, some weak form of NISIC that you can build from, uh, from CDH. Uh, so for instance, uh, combining as is and taking into account the caveats, what we get 
is an ISIC from the sub exponential harness of CDH. Again, kind of the restriction on the, on the group are inherited from the NISIC that we get from DDH. And where the uh, verifier is non uniform and non explicit, and Sonnet only holds infinity of it. Okay? And it turns out that this recipe is actually slightly more general. You can kind of swap out those boxes. And for instance, if you start with a different construction of NISIX, from, uh, which assumes the harness of both DDH and LPN, then you get an appropriate, uh, and you get an appropriate music. So for instance, here the difference is that there will be no restriction on G uh, on the group cryptographic group G, and the harness that you will assume uh, only needs to be polynomial. And last, if you care about ZAPs, I won't define uh, in too much detail what, what ZAPs are, but you can also replace uh, those blocks with ZAPs. And uh, what you get are ZAP arguments. Okay. So, um, that's uh, kind, of the, kind of the main blueprint on how we get results. Uh, now I'll talk about slightly more uh, in slightly more technical detail about how we can uh, try to make these disjunction arguments slightly uh, better in, in order to address a bit the caveat that we have. So that will be a bit more uh, in, a bit more technical. Uh, so again, uh, the caveat that we have is that the verifier is non-uniform, non-explicit, and soundness holds uh, infinitely often. Um, uh, and another thing you can notice is that this is actually kind of um, standard drawback that you get when you get a construction uh, that builds on the insecurity of like uh, some security assumption. So this is kind of a generic problem that we have in some like, techniques that look like that. Um, so our main idea will be to, okay, so, so, so far the argument was going as follow. If you fix a group, Either this proof uh, is either the proof that's based on DDH will be secure in some weak sense, or the proof based on DDH will be secure in a weak sense. What we'll do is to have a slightly more refined approach where, depending on the security parameter, we'll either use the green proof or the orange proof. So I want to make that kind of uh, operational. So the thing that I need is to find a way to identify, given the security parameter, uh, which proof to use. So not only I want to find which proof to use, I want to find an explicit break so that if DDH does not hold, I actually have an associated break to run the orange proof. Yeah. And it turns out that this we can do um, if we had our hands on some universal breaker. So what would be a universal breaker? That would be kind of a, 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 an algorithm that given a security parameter tests whether uh, DDH is broken or not. And if it's broken, we'd find an explicit break. So again, if a break exists, then my algorithm finds it. And if it doesn't find any break, then it kind of ensures me that DDH uh, holds in, in, the, in this group. Uh, so the rest of the talk will be, uh, like the rest of the technical uh, part will be kind of um, trying to define and construct this. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so it turns out that we have to be quite careful uh, and in particular, making sense of this requires some care. And that's, again, mainly because of how we define security. One first mismatch uh, the, between what I want, for instance, finding an, ex, uh, an explicit break, is that if DDH, uh, we consider the standard non-uniform harness of DDH, the only break that we can hope for are non-uniform breaks, which are still far from what we want in terms of having an explicit and uh, uniform algorithm. So uh, to do that, we'll, uh, to fix that, we'll replace the harness of DDH with the uniform harness of DDH. And we can, looking ahead, the, the cost will be that we'll downgrade soundness, so non-uniform soundness, to uniform soundness. And there are uh, more um, kind of more annoying things when you, uh, you want to um, reason about security on fixed security parameters. Uh, the main problem is that security is really defined asymptotically. So however like, you want to think about it, you, you have to be pretty careful. So for instance, uh, so concretely, um, like one annoying thing is that um, even talking about uniform security doesn't really make sense, um, uh, doesn't really make sense for um, fixed security parameter because there's no notion of like having a fixed Turing machine that solves on all the security parameters if you only look at the security parameter. So that we fix uh, by bounding the size of the Turing machine that we consider. And uh, last, uh, polynomial time or some exponential time does, again, doesn't like, seem to like, very, very make sense on a fixed security parameter. So we have to be a bit careful and that we fix using uh, 
uh, we fix concrete functions T epsilon and then consider T epsilon insecurity. Okay, so what comes out of this is that now we have a modified version of security for DDH where we took care of that and we have kind of um, something that's kind of in between uniform and non-uniform security. Um, so we are only concerned with uniform turn machines or like this is related to, uh, to the size of uniform advice, but, uh, but never mind. Uh, where we bound uh, the size of the machines and we fix their, their running time and their advantage. And now for this, uh, the definition of security, first up to uh, the, this uh, small difference over there. So soundness will only hold in the green setting for uniform adversaries. But up to that, we can then test kind of all Turing machines using a kind of standard universal argument and find, uh, find breaks when they, when they exist. Okay, so now I have an algorithm that have uh, those properties. How do I make that into an ISIC? Turns out that if you start at it, um, if you start the building blocks, uh, zero knowledge is really not the issue. So the, the simplest thing in our case is to have the provers just send both of the, both of the proofs that will not affect zero knowledge. And then the verifier using this universal breaker, we kind of internally decide what uh, proof to verify. So again, the hope is that if DDH is secure, then it will verify the, the green proof. And if DDH is broken, then it will verify the orange proof. And he will do that by running this universal breaker. Okay. So now, uh, because uh, our universal breaker is explicit, it just runs over all Turing machines and tests whether uh, they break it. Our uniform is uniform and explicit. So we took care of some of the caveats. And unfortunately, even though you could believe that maybe uh, there's, um, there's a well-defined procedure that works on all security parameters, kind of inherently our universal breaker runs in more time than the adversaries that it's finding. So we need to use complexity leveraging that's uh, kind of inherent in our approach. And so we don't get soundness on all security parameters. But we can ensure that soundness holds for a somewhat dense set of security parameters. So more formally, for every interval that looks like that, kind of, uh, you will find a sound security parameter in uh, every such interval. Okay. So uh, to recap, our main contribution uh, is to build uh, uh, a NISIC, both NISICs for NP and ZAP arguments for NP, assuming the sub-exponential hardness of CDH with some restriction over the group. Um, but where the main caveats are that the soundness that we achieve is pretty weak in the sense that it only holds sub expansion often. So there's like, uh, it, it's slightly better than infinitely often, but it's still pretty far from what you would uh, actually expect from a real music. And soundness holds against uh, only uniform changing groups because we relied on the, uh, the uniform um, security of DDH uh, in our argument. Uh, so our main technique is a, is a simple disjunction argument that we can make slightly better using some form of universal breakers. So it turns out that this, um, this idea of using a new universal breaker can also be used in other contexts where you rely on the insecurity of, uh, of a primitive to build, uh, to build uh, other, cryptographic, uh, other cryptographic applications in particular that, that brings uniformity and explicit algorithms. And as main open questions, well, uh, the main open question would be uh, from this work would be to either address more properly the caveats of like uh, those caveats or just find another construction that doesn't, uh, don't have these. And uh, well, like, again, like kind of what we're shooting for in the long term is like to be honest from public encryption. But also I would be super interested in getting more uh, of uh, out of like this kind of disjunction arguments in particular, can we build more uh, cryptography for, for instance, where uh, using CDH over pairings. So over pairings, DDH is easy. You can test yourself um, whether something is a DDH trouble. Can we get more crypto using this kind of disjunction argument? Uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, thanks for your attention. Any questions? Thanks. Uh, is it interesting to consider trade-offs with uh, um, largening the soundless loss? Uh, sorry, can I repeat? I couldn't hear. Is it interesting to consider trade-offs with uh, enlargening the soundless loss? Uh, 
like not just restricting yourself sorry i i just yeah not just uh, restricting yourself to negligible soundness but maybe widening the sorry okay, i was talking to make it but so yeah, is a question about like the um... Like uh, considering like weaker notion of soundness, like with yeah, just yeah. So so that that, that would uh, reflect directly into the, in terms of like assumption that that, that we use and things like that. If the if the blocks like the building blocks like allow to to do that, but I don't think you will buy okay. that much. You can consider it, but I don't think you will. Think so. Let me just one just one question about like the sub exponentially often security parameter that you get. Like, uh, is it hard actually to find like? The security parameter in that interval, and like how problematic that is to find or not finding that, or uh, yeah, yeah. So um, it's essentially, uh, if I, I don't know how to go back. Sure. Um, oh yeah. So um, so oh, well. <laughs> so, so so what's happening is like uh, you are completely leveraging the the um, the version where you need to find the break because finding the break will be more efficient. Um, so essentially what will happen is that either the original proof using DDH will be secure or the one using the complexity leveraging will be secure. So there, it will be one of the, those two, right? Uh, the, the issue is that the, the, the uh, NISIG from DDH is actually more complicated than that, uh, than that, uh, than that. It requires actually like trust room security on many security, uh, security of DDH on many security parameters because they in turn use a lot of complexity leveraging. So what uh, what happens is that you have a list, a concrete list of like lambda security parameters in there where you know that one will work. Okay, one question from the Zoom, Zoom audience. Then can you clarify that either your prover or verifier have to check for all order log lambda size Turing machines? Or was that just part of your simulation or soundness argument? Um, sorry, can you repeat that? So, so, yeah, so if, if I understand correctly, the, the, the question is about clarifying what, uh, like, what the universal argument uh, like, uh, is used. And particularly in our case, um, kind of because zero knowledge, um, the universal argument is used to kind of so, sorry, the harness assumptions are only used for soundness. So the prover doesn't need to like detect it. Or, like there's no issue with, uh, so zero knowledge here holds everywhere. And there's like no issue of like trying to find secure, uh, secure parameters for DDH or uh, yeah. There's no issue with finding secure parameters for CDH uh, for the prover because zero knowledge is fine. So the only issue arise, arises in soundness and then therefore, like, yeah, we can just send all the proofs and the verifier can do everything. If that answers the question. Are there any questions? Okay, if not, uh, please thanks to the Willie and the all speakers again.